We've looked at the lives of a number of women in Scripture. And wh why would I choose something like that? The reason I chose it is because largely we tend to neglect the women of Scripture. We deal with the, the epistles. We deal with the, the men sometimes, men of faith like, like Abraham and others. But we don't often talk about the sisters. I think it's clear when we look at the lives of even the few sisters that we've looked at, that their lives were as complex, as challenging, as fraught as the lives of the men they kept company with. There were times when they had to be strong, when they had to be the spiritual dynamo of the relationship. And there were other times when the decisions they made, just as with the brethren, were decisions made in a moment of time, without a lot of thought, and with consequences sometimes that were not what they intended. These great women in the faith are an inspiration to us, as you are sisters to your brothers today. I would say some of the most spiritual people that I know in my life are sisters. Older sisters often are so full of the Word of God, so full of wisdom, so full of understanding of all of the limitations and constraints, all of the, all of the issues that afflict us wherever we find ourselves. And that is across the board, in all countries, in all cultures. It doesn't matter, rich, poor, black, white, yellow, red. It doesn't matter. Wherever we go, we'll find sisters with that kind of wisdom that God has put into these ecclesias to help them to be strong. We need you at our side, sisters. We need your help. We need your support. We need your encouragement. As our spirits fail, as, as our energy flags, we need you to encourage us to keep steady and keep along the road that we need to be on. When you look at the Ecclesia and you see all the needs that exist that we as brethren sometimes miss because we're engaged in all sorts of things. Tell us, remind us that the truth in the Ecclesia is not just about doctrine. It's not just about exposition. It is also about the care of the flock and the nurturing of its members. Share with us the work that you are doing and help us as we lead. And as we, in a world where leadership is so poor and roles have merged across the genders and there is so much in the way of confusion in people's minds, strengthen us and help us and support us as we lead. You are the people that hold ecclesias together. You are the people who are at the heart <clears throat> of what is often really going on in families and in ecclesias. And were it not for you, there would be no truth. The first woman in the Garden of Eden must have had so many things to look back on when she was an old woman. Seeing so many generations of people <clears throat> that came from her and Adam, as the generations went by, there is nothing she would not have seen, nothing that would have shocked her. She would have had a depth of perception, being the first of all women. Can you imagine that no woman since has had to the same degree? I could just imagine in my mind even her tent and a couple of young girls, teenagers, walking by the tent. And Eve just overhearing a snippet of conversation. One girl saying to the other, 
don't go near the old lady's tent. And for goodness sake, don't let her get you in a conversation with that problem you have. And he was saying, girls, come, come, let's have a cup of tea. So, how are you doing? And Eve's kindly, sharp, perceptive, warm, penetrating eyes looking at them both. And as the conversation went on, talking about nothing in particular, Eve would turn to the one girl and say, what you want to do is not going to make you happy. Don't do it. And Adam and Eve, when sin occurred in the garden, and marriage problems came because they did, you can well imagine, couldn't you? The first human couple. You never listen to what I say. You're always doing what you want to do and your own thing. Remember what you did in Eden? Yes, and if you had opened your mouth and said something, we might have had a different result and we might still be in Eden, wouldn't we? Now, doesn't that sound like a real couple to you? It doesn't sound like poetry and people walking around in robes speaking Shakespeare, does it? It sounds like a real husband and wife. And can you not imagine the two of them angry and not talking for a while? But Adam going to his wife and saying, yes, you're right. I shouldn't have said that. And boy, do I wish I had said something in the Garden of Eden. Adam didn't say anything. He didn't open his mouth, which is why the brethren teach today. They have to open their mouth. They have to lead, they have to teach, and they have to guide. And, and like Adam, they may not have, they may not have the perfect answer. They may have self-doubt. They may realize that, spiritually speaking, we're right there in the trench with mud in our mouth with the least of our brothers and sisters. Who are we to get up and teach anyone? I can tell you that's how you three speakers feel this week too. But we do it because God has instructed us to do it. And boy, do we need the support of the women around us and in our lives and in, in our marriages and who are related to us to encourage us, to help us to do that work that we do. But we lead. And Adam didn't lead. Adam was led. When we honor the roles that God has given us, though they are completely unpopular as far as today's world is concerned, and they might actually look quite antiquated to the people who live in the world in which we live, when we honor the roles that God has given us, then it's a source of joy and pleasure to Him. And it isn't easy. Could it have been easy for Eve to listen to Adam after what happened in the Garden of Eden? Was it easy for Sarah to listen to Abram after what happened in Egypt? And then again with Abimelech. And then again when he said, I'm going to take our son and sacrifice him. Was it easy for her? It wasn't easy. And it wasn't a thing that happened to her. It was a choice she made. It was a choice. Let's look briefly at 1 Peter chapter 3. Now this is a very interesting passage because it comes in the context of the atonement. The death, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, not really. 
It comes in the context of great persecution, a breakdown in ecclesial life, a breakdown in family life, breakdown in the society all around the ecclesia. And so using the atonement as something to anchor themselves, Peter says the following words. He says in verse 18 of chapter 2, servants, we might read that employees in this day and age, be subject to your masters with all fear. Does, it, does that mean that, they, that today we are to be afraid of our employees? No, but fear of God, reverence for God, respect for God. Not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward, the crooked, the hard to deal with. For this is thankworthy if a man, for conscience toward God, endure grief, suffering wrongfully. Now this is something that God will find pleasing, that you're prepared to put up with tough circumstances, sometimes in the workplace. I'm not talking about illegal. I'm not talking about the abusive things that can happen. But putting up with the day-to-day -day indignities, inconveniences, troubles, trials, together with the good things in the workplace. In this context, it may have been more serious because servants, slaves, bond servants were beaten by their owners. So, harsher circumstances, but in that time, this is the guidance to them. So he says, moving on from that, verse 20, For what glory is it, if when we be buffeted for our faults or your faults, ye shall take it patiently. But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. And this is, this is the important piece for us to look at. For even her, hereunto were ye called. So we weren't called to a life of ease. And every one of the women we've looked at, not a single one of them was called to a life of ease. None of them, not one of them. The difficulties of our lives are intended to be a part of our life as believers because they, they bring out of us who we will become for God's kingdom. For even hereunto were ye called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps, who did no sin, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness. And so, and so what he's saying is this, Christ set an example of someone who was entitled to better behavior than that which he received. But he didn't stand on an entitlement. He fulfilled his obligations to God and for us. He suffered. He was treated as a sinner, though he did no sin. And so all the unfairness that he could have talked about, he didn't talk about. But he did what had to be done. And the atonement is something that then informs how we do the work we do, with honor, with integrity. And when we complain, when we find ourselves whining or, or backbiting or, or bad-mouthing, we, we ask for forgiveness from God and try to keep on doing what we do so that we understand even our work is touched by the atonement. Then chapter 3 begins with the words, likewise or in the same way. Now what, what, what does that mean? It means in the same way as the work and the career and the workplace are touched by the atonement so is our relationship as wives. And so he says in the same way, 
ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. Now I know you might think as a wife in some of the some of the tougher moments, you know, if my husband was like that man, that brother, I would be in subjection to him. Because that's the kind of man that I would be in subjection to. But that's, that's not what it says. <laughs> it says be in subjection to your own, your own husband. Which means that it's a choice that you make. It's not something that naturally wells up because he is who he should be. It's a choice that you make. That even if any obey not the word, they also may, without the word, be won by the behavior of their wives. And we look at that, and we tend to interpret that to mean if you're married to someone outside the truth, the way that you conduct yourself may persuade him into the truth. And that's true. That's one way of interpreting that. But there's another way of interpreting it also. When your husband who is in the truth is at a moment or a time or a period in his life when he's drifting and he's not particularly strong at all in the truth and he's not giving the leadership that he needs to give the home is divided and like Isaac on one side and Rebecca on the other. It's very, very difficult. Peter's guidance is still do the right thing. Still conduct yourself as a sister who respects and loves him and honors him. And if you have to do the readings with the children alone, with him somewhere in the room not participating or in another room, do it anyway. And together with that, still show the respect that you need to show as a wife. And that, that can win him over. That can win him over. It is sometimes the faith and the strongly anchored certainty that God is who he is and will do what he will do and is alive and working in our lives that is in a sister that can carry the family through a period of time when a husband may not be doing what he needs to be doing and may be going in a quite opposite direction. And Sarah, Sarah had to be strong sometimes when Abraham and Abraham found it difficult to stay well anchored in God's truth. And yet, were it not for Sarah, what would have happened to Abraham? If you had asked him that question, he would have said to you, I couldn't have done it without her. I wouldn't have made it if it wasn't for Sarah. And that's how your husband often feels, though he may not say it out loud. I know, were it not for Rose, I don't know what would have happened to me. And so this little passage talks about the struggles of a wife, a sister, in marriage, and helps her to, to find comfort not easy, pat solutions. There's, there's, no, there's no easy solutions to some of these problems. But comfort and encouragement. Comfort and encouragement. And so, sisters, remember, without you, there's no ecclesial life. Without you, we wouldn't be able to do the work that we do. So help us. Be at our side and strengthen us so that we can lead and support us as we do it. Mary Magdalene. There are all kinds of myths and legends that have grown up around this woman. 
We know little. Brethren have made a good case for the fact that she and Mary of Bethany might have been the same person. But we're going to look at it very simply, just based on what we see, where her name is actually mentioned. Her name wasn't Magdalene. She was one of a few Marys. It seems to have been a fairly common name, like, like John might be. I'm sorry, John, if you, you're troubled by that. It's a good name, John. It's just a, it's a common name. And she was differentiated from the others as Mary of Magdala. Magdala was a town whose name meant watchtower. Watchtower. We read about her, Mary Magdalene, in the Gospel of Luke. Gospel of Luke. And we're going to go to Luke chapter 8. And this is what it says. Verse 2. And certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary that was called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils, and Joanna, the wife of Cusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others, which ministered unto him, some versions say ministered unto them, the disciples as a group, of their substance. And so in, the, that, in that little verse, there's a significant amount of data, information. One. Mary of Magdala was one of a number of women who had had serious problems that Christ had healed. It says out of Mary was cast seven devils, seven demons. And we know when we look at, at, at the New Testament, that mental illness, when it shows itself, was understood to be the individual possessed by some kind of demon or devil. Now, that's the way that the Jews understood these things, having brought from Babylon certain things that were added on to the beliefs taught by Scripture. They had these complex hierarchies of, of angels and also of the opposites of angels. And a lot of time was spent working out which kinds of angels worked in what kind of work and lived in what kind of section of some place where the angels lived. And this, this obsession with angels is something that even shows up in the, in the New Testament in, in Paul's epistles, where he encourages brothers and sisters not to go in the direction of becoming immersed and submerged and drowned in, in that, kind of, that kind of study, that kind of thinking. But what these people had was mental illness. And back then, the level of ignorance was such that they called it demons. Well, here in the sophisticated 21st century and in North America, the level of ignorance that exists in connection with mental illness is still very great. Many brothers and sisters suffer with serious mental illness. The American National Institute of Mental Health estimates that one in five Americans is affected by mental illness. We can see things like lesions on our bodies. You could see Miriam's leprosy, but you couldn't see any kind of lesion 
on Mary Magdalene or on our brothers and sisters who struggle with mental illness. Now, if the world outside says, says one in five, and in fact, many clinicians indicate it might be closer to one in three. And here's what they also say, and we don't know why this increase in mental illness is happening. We think it could be a combination of things, many of which might be associated with the society in which we live. The pace of change, the stress in people's lives, the fear and the anxiety that people struggle with today, compared possibly to past generations. These things have increased possibly the amount of illness that there is out there. People suffer with depression. People suffer with high anxiety and panic attacks, panic disorder. People suffer with bipolar disorder, with schizophrenia, and with a number of other kinds of mental illness. And sometimes amongst us, there's the feeling, well, look, if these people just behaved themselves properly, they wouldn't be ill. And others say, look, there's no mental illness. And the answers for everything, every possible thing, are in Scripture. If you read your Bible enough, you won't be mentally ill. And yet it's been demonstrated that mental illness is an issue of the chemistry of the brain. These are illnesses of the brain. And sometimes experience of trauma in early childhood can begin a process that leads in the end to mental illness. What our brothers and sisters need from us who have mental illness is not the ongoing and continuous stigma and shame that they feel because we make them feel that they're different to us. What our brothers and sisters who struggle with mental illness need from us is warmth, compassion, and understanding. We can't cure and we can't pretend to be people who can cure mental illness. But what we can do is be part of the network of support which helps brothers and sisters who struggle with mental illness to feel a sense of, of comfort and encouragement. There is a brother who once said that the way that he talks to people who have mental illness is he talks about the illness itself. So he goes up to a brother who has terrible depression in his ecclesia and he doesn't say to him, how are you doing? He says, how's the depression right now? And the brother is able to talk about it. Well, it's, it's really tough. I wake up in the morning and I feel like there's a, there's a black cloud all around me. I don't even feel like getting out of bed. I don't want to wash myself. I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't even want to eat. I just want to stay in that bed. And then I think that I have got some kids I need to look after and I get up out of that bed for them. I know they need a better father than me, but I'm the one they've got. And I do what little I can to help them, to give them the lunch and to take care of them, to get them to school. And the other brother says to him, I just want you to know I'm here if you need me for anything. I can make the time and help with the kids. I can get groceries for you, pick you up and take you to get groceries, take you to the pharmacy to get your medication. And you know I'm happy to pick you up and get you to the meeting anytime. 
and I'm there at the end of the phone if you need to talk. Just give me a call. Now think of what you've done in just doing that. You've given that brother the sense he has someone who cares. The brother never said to him, I know exactly what you're going through and I know just what you feel like, because he doesn't. He didn't say that. He didn't diminish. Oh, well, all you have to do is, you should just, you ought to. He didn't do any of that. And the Lord Jesus Christ looked into the eyes of this suffering woman, saw what she was struggling with. He saw the pain. He saw the shame. He saw her aloneness. He took that illness out of her and she could see clearly and there was no weight and the dark cloud was gone and all of the fear and all of the terror was gone and she looked at him and what did she see in his face respect love understanding Compassion, brotherly kindness, and no judgment. And she decided then and there, and I'm going to follow him. Mary stayed with the Lord Jesus Christ. He had given her her life back she would give him everything she had. And so with a group of women, whatever money they had, whatever she had saved, whatever she had inherited, whatever she had gotten doing, whatever she did, she ministered to his needs and the needs of the disciples with the money that she had. We see her next, brothers and sisters, in John chapter 19. John chapter 19, that awful, awful, awful day, that awful, awful scene. The men had all run away, except for the beloved disciple. They'd all run away. All the big, bad, strong men who would defend Christ no matter what happened, they would never abandon him. They'd all run away. And one had lied three times when he was told that he was one of them. And here, here at the foot of the cross, are women. Just think how brave these women were. Now, you have to imagine your way into the scene. These are women who have chosen to throw their reputations away by standing at the foot of the cross of a man condemned to death by the Roman authorities and the Jewish leaders. They had chosen to throw their reputations away. Never again in whatever neighborhood they lived in, unless they were surrounded by disciples, would they ever be respected or seen as respectable women again. Never again. And they were all right with that. So that they could be with Jesus. And Mary Magdalene, it says, was one of them. Verse 25, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene. Now you, you know what must have gone through his mother's heart looking at him. Imagine Mary Magdalene looking up at the face of Jesus, looking at what they had done to the man that she saw as her Lord. 
as the man who had saved her, as the man that respected her where no one else respected her, for her to look at what they had done to him. I can't even imagine what these women went through as they looked at what they saw on that cross. And she saw and she heard, <laughs> she heard him speak even in the middle of his agony for the comfort of his mother to strengthen her. And there is this brave, courageous, loyal, grateful, faithful, loving watchtower of a woman with him in his agony. She didn't run away. And yet there's no record of her saying, I will never, ever betray you and I will never leave you. It was the men that said those things and they couldn't deliver. So here's Mary. Here's Mary. Chapter 20, brothers and sisters. Mary, early in the morning, it's still dark, goes to the tomb, notices that the stone has been rolled away. Other women might have gone too, but John chooses to focus on Mary Magdalene, Mary of Magdala, out of whom seven demons, the mentally sick woman, had been cast out. It says she runs and finds Simon Peter and John, or the disciple whom Jesus loved, coming along the way and says they've taken away the Lord. They've taken away the Lord and we don't know where they've laid him. We, referring to the fact that there were other women that were there at the tomb. The men look in. Peter and the the beloved disciple have their situation. They, one runs to the tomb, can't bear to take himself all the way in. The other runs past him and goes into the tomb. Into the tomb. And it says, verse 11, But Mary stood outside, weeping. Now, <laughs> There's a very typical man moment here. I'm sorry, brethren, but the sisters will enjoy this one. Here is a sister in distress. Look what it says in verse 10. Then the disciples went away again into their own home. And who's left? Not Peter and the beloved disciple, but Mary, crying crying at the tomb. She's crying at the tomb. Why? She loved him. But why? She wanted that moment to have the last opportunity to honor the man who had honored her so greatly. To prepare her body, his body, properly. Yes, Nicodemus had brought the spices that he'd brought, but perhaps because of the closeness to the Sabbath, the circumstances, he couldn't use all of them and prepare the body fully. So the women had come and Mary had led them to the tomb in order to fully treat the body, wrap it properly. Mind you, they came in hopes that someone else might be able to roll the stone away for them. Perhaps they felt the Roman gods would still be there. And she is at the tomb, unable to give that last offering of love to the man who had shown so much kindness to her. And as she wept, she stooped down, and she looked into the sepulcher, and seeth two angels in white, the one at the head, the other at the feet but the body of Jesus had laid. Isn't it wonderful? 
two angels. There's no wings or anything like that. But doesn't it remind us of those two beings on either end of the, the Ark of the Covenant? The mercy seat upon which blood was poured in the middle. And those two angels which imply community. The fulfillment of whose future is in us. Those that will be made perfect in God's kingdom. One is at the head, one is at the foot, and it's just reminiscent. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a resonating image back to the cherubim. And of course there's no body. Because the resurrection has occurred. And what is the first word that is spoken in the tomb where there is no more death, no body? The promise to the woman has been fulfilled. The woman in Eden. What is the first word that's said in that empty tomb? Woman. Why are you crying? Woman, the first word that's said in the empty tomb with a full reversal of what had happened in the Garden of Eden with the first woman and the first man. Woman, <coughs> Why are you crying? And it says, Because they have taken away my Lord. I don't know where they've laid him. When she had said this, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing. She didn't know who he was. And Jesus says to her, Woman, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? And that casts our minds right back to the two men who took John's direction and followed the man. And he knew they were following him. And he turns around to them and he says, What are you looking for? What are you looking for? And now at the end of the Gospel of John, that was the beginning. He says to her, who are you looking for? And she says, she said, sir, if you know where they've taken the body, tell me and I will go and take him away. And Jesus discloses who he is. Mary. She turns again and she says to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. And Jesus says to her, Stop clinging on to me. I'm not yet ascended to my Father. Now, I'm going to steal another minute or two, and you can take it from tomorrow's session. <laughs> this is a quotation from Eureka. It's Eureka, volume 3, page 584. And this is in connection with this matter of the ascension of Christ, what he's talking about. Brother Thomas writes, Jesus was also upon the third day justified by the Spirit or made perfect in ascending by the power of the Spirit from the earth-born nature to <laughs> consubstantiality of substance with the Father who is Spirit. Now, I know I have to explain consubstantiality, right? Because in this day and age, it's a word that may be difficult for us. And it means of the same kind of nature. Spirit. So Jesus is raised mortal. And he's not yet been given immortality. So he's not saying, stop clinging to me, it's inappropriate. Which is what some people interpret this to be saying in commentaries. He's saying, don't hold on to me. There's a change that has to occur. And I've got, I've got to go through that change. I can't stay with you right now. And then... He says to her, to the woman, 
to the sick, the woman who had been mentally ill, who no one respected, who had and carried that terrible stigma of mental illness. He says, Go to my brethren, and you say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. So he sends her with the message of the resurrection. A woman had been involved in death coming into the earth, though Adam is held accountable. And a woman is involved in bringing the message of eternal life fulfilled to reverse everything that happened in Eden. And so it says, and here we leave her, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. May we soon, brothers and sisters, get the opportunity to meet these women, to talk to them, and to see what God has made of them through all that they have been through in their lives and the work that they will have to do in God's kingdom as we work together with them at this side.